The Bible is full of fascinating stories and lessons, but there's one tale, the Book of Enoch, that's wrapped in a cloud of mystery because it's not part of the regular lineup of biblical texts. Ever wondered why this ancient book got the cold shoulder and what's so intense about it that it ended up on the no-show list? Let's dive into the secrets that have been kept under wraps for ages. 10. Book of Enoch so there's this fascinating character named Enoch, not just a random name in ancient texts, but a big deal in the history tucked inside the Bible. We've got this intriguing piece called the Book of Enoch, right? It's been capturing folks' curiosity for ages, not your typical religious read. They think it was written way back, around 300 to 100 BC, and it dives into some pretty wild topics. Enoch himself was something special. He's connected directly to some famous biblical figures, being the great-grandson of Adam and the great-grandfather of Noah. Now that's quite the lineage. His writings, they give us a sneak peek into the ancient world, filled with stories of fallen angels, dramatic prophecies about the end times, and the Nephilim, those legendary giants who were said to be the children of angels and humans. But here's the juicy part. The Book of Enoch was considered too controversial for the regular Bible lineup. It's full of edgy stories about angels stepping out of bounds, hidden truths of the cosmos, and it even dishes on why the Great Flood happened. Lately, it's been getting some attention again, even popping up in movies and discussions like in the movie Noah from 2014. For a long time, this book was like a secret treasure, mostly hidden until it resurfaced in Ethiopia. The early Christian folks were into it, but when it came time to finalize what goes into the Bible, Enoch's book didn't make the cut. Still, it's managed to keep its allure over the years, particularly for those drawn to the mysterious and the mythic. From ancient religious groups to today's seekers, after the hidden, the Book of Enoch keeps captivating people with its mix of heavenly secrets and epic earthly tales. And here's a kicker, the Book of Enoch touches on some stuff that seems to stretch beyond what science can easily explain. Enoch's journey was all about charting the heavens, kind of like our understanding of the solar system. He mapped out the stars and planets, naming the biggest loop Kronos. Yep, that sounds a lot like our Saturn. He went on to name others after gods, like Venus for Aphrodite and Mars for Ares, weaving in more characters like Zeus and Hermes and wrapped up with the moon. This celestial naming shows Enoch's view was pretty in line with how the Greeks saw the cosmos. And think about this, long before we started shooting rockets into space and sending satellites to orbit, the Book of Enoch had all these cosmic insights. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? How could this ancient text have such detailed knowledge way before modern astronomy? Kind of makes you joke about finding the secret to becoming a billionaire in there, right? But seriously, the depth and mysteries in that book are something to ponder. 9. The original manuscript of the Bible is missing. So let's hop on a time machine and explore the story behind the Bible, okay? Think of the Bible as this massive anthology of 66 books, written by about 40 different people over 1,400 years. We're journeying way back, ending almost 2,000 years ago. Now you might wonder, do we still have the original copies? Sadly, no. Those ancient writings have turned to dust over the centuries. But here's the cool part. We've got loads of early copies that give us a pretty good look at what these texts were like in their prime. Let's walk through history a bit. The Old Testament started taking shape around 1400 BC with Moses and finished up by 400 BC with Ezra. And you know what's amazing? Some bits of these texts showed up in the Dead Sea Scrolls by the 2nd century BC. Then there's the Cairo Geniza stash from the 1st century AD, offering more glimpses into these old writings. Jumping ahead, the Aleppo Codex from around 930 and the Leningrad Codex from 1008 are like the ultimate Old Testament compilations in Hebrew, both a thousand years old. And then there's the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament from the second century BC, showing that the Old Testament was all set even before Jesus's time. Switching to the New Testament, that's more recent, written between the AD 40s and 90s, the oldest piece we have is a part of John's Gospel from around AD 125. With over 5,000 Greek manuscripts, it's like putting together a giant puzzle 
that beautifully outlines the early Christian story. The real gem, the Codex Sinaiticus from the 4th century, packed with the complete New Testament, shows these writings were popular long before this codex was even a thing. And let's not overlook early church big shots like Clement of Rome, quoting the New Testament in the first century, or the second century work that blends the Gospels, sharing Jesus' story. Even though the original Bible writings are history, the fragments and manuscripts we have today throw us back to what the original authors wanted to share. It's like piecing together history, one parchment and papyrus at a time, all woven together by deep faith. Eight, the Trinity is not found in the Bible. Let's get into one of the big head scratches in religious talks, the Trinity. It's a concept that's been around since the late second century, thanks to a guy named Tertullian who came up with the term Trinitus. This idea isn't just a simple belief. It's a major player in Christian thought, suggesting that God is actually three distinct but connected figures. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's like the ultimate team-up in the spiritual world. This trio isn't just chilling together. They're seen as equally important and forever linked, shaping a strong unit in the faith's core. However, not everyone's cool with this idea. Some groups, like the Latter-day Saints and Jehovah's Witnesses, don't really buy into this trio thing, which keeps the discussions pretty lively even after all these years. The term Trinity itself isn't spelled out in the Bible, but hints of this three-way setup are sprinkled throughout the Holy Book, offering glimpses of God working in a three-layered fashion. From the Father's role in creation, to the Son's adventures on Earth, and the Holy Spirit's mysterious actions, it feels like a divine script played out across the universe. Events like Jesus' baptism or the Transfiguration are like big scenes where all three stars make an appearance, adding some serious weight to the stories in the Bible. And then you have those puzzling symbols like the Borromean rings or the Triketra that throw in a bit of mystery, representing how the three parts are eternally linked. So whether people see it as a deep theological principle or an enigmatic puzzle, the Trinity stands as one of the key elements in Christianity, weaving a narrative of a three-in-one God that continues to fascinate and inspire debates among both followers and scholars. 7. Deadly Sins All right, let's talk about something you might find interesting. The Seven Deadly Sins. Now, aside from being a popular anime title, these sins have deep roots in Christian tradition, covering the big no-nos like envy, gluttony, greed, lust, pride, sloth, and wrath. These sins are super old school in moral lessons, not just scary parts of Dante's Inferno, where they lead to some seriously bad outcomes. Now, if you take a peek into the Bible, you're not going to find a section with the seven deadly sins slapped on it as a headline. That exact phrase doesn't show up in the holy texts, what the Bible does talk about is how to live a life steering clear of sinful actions. There's a spot in Paul's letter to the Galatians where he calls out bad behaviors like lust and jealousy, but he doesn't drop a list of seven specific sins. Jumping ahead to the year 590 AD, Pope Gregory the Great decided to add his own touch. He brought in invidia, Latin for envy, and finalized what we now think of as the seven deadly sins. Later, Thomas Aquinas, a big name in theology, gave these sins a nod in his work, Summa Theologica, branding them as capital sins because they're like the main reasons people start doing wrong. Zooming to our times, the idea of the seven deadly sins is still alive in Christian teaching, with churches like the Anglican and Methodist still discussing them. Modern day preachers like Billy Graham have even tackled these sins, trying to make them relevant for today's world. So, while they might not be as flashy as the anime, the concept of the seven deadly sins has traveled a long road through history, influencing how people figure out right from wrong. Six, does the Bible teach that the earth is round or flat? In the world of Christian faith, the Bible is like the ultimate guidebook, believed to be the word of God. But here's something to ponder. While it's the main source for spiritual and ethical wisdom, it doesn't cover everything under the sun. For instance, you're not going to find Bible verses explaining calculus or the elements of the periodic table. However, this doesn't mean those fields of knowledge aren't valid. They just exist in a different realm. 
from the Bible's teachings. Now let's talk about a topic as big as the planet itself, the shape of the Earth. The Bible doesn't directly announce that Earth is round, but it gives us hints, like in the creation story in Genesis, with the mention of a watery world, which kind of suggests roundness, right? Because in space, physics shows us that water takes a spherical shape due to gravity. Genesis also talks about the gathering of land, which makes a lot of sense if you think of Earth as a sphere. But it's not just the Bible touching on this. Science has been on the round Earth bandwagon ages, ever since guys like Pythagoras started wondering about our planet's shape. And today, we've got tons of evidence from space missions and satellite images that show Earth as a beautiful round orb. Even simple things like seeing a ship gradually disappear over the horizon point to Earth's curvature. So where does this flat Earth idea come from? It seems like a big misunderstanding of the Bible mixed with some pretty wild stories. The Bible doesn't really clash with scientific findings. It leaves space for exploration and understanding. It's important, especially for believers, to distinguish between what's solid and what's just sensational myth. The Apostle Paul talked about being careful not to get swept up in weird ideas, kind of a heads up to value the truth. So, in blending faith with facts, we should always stand firm on the solid ground of proven truth, both from the Bible and from science. 5. What was the reason why Judas betrayed Jesus? Judas Iscariot's story is one for the ages really sticking in history as the guy who betrayed Jesus for a few coins. Sure, Peter gets a lot of attention among the twelve disciples, but Judas? He's like a puzzle wrapped in a mystery. Let's dig into his tale. This guy, Judas, has a past that's more shadowy than clear. His origins? Kind of a blur. His entrance to the scene? Not well documented. But his notorious act? That's what everyone remembers. So here's the deal. Judas allegedly got 30 silver coins to lead the authorities to Jesus. And how did he mark Jesus out for them? Not with a point or a nod, but with a kiss. That's the story told by Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the Bible. This led to Jesus being taken to Pontius Pilate, and well, it was a pivotal moment in history. But hang on, there's a twist in the tale. There's this old text, over a thousand years old, translated from Coptic, that drops a juicy bit. It suggests Jesus was kind of incognito, so Judas's kiss was needed to reveal his identity. This angle, isn't in the usual Bible stories, which don't really say why Judas used a kiss of all things. Then there's this idea, hinted at in Luke and John's writings, that maybe Judas was under some dark influence, possibly even Satan's, during the whole betrayal saga. The info on Judas is scattered through various texts, sketching a picture of him that's both complex and hotly debated. Was he just after money, caught up in some bigger cosmic plan, or was his role all written to fit into a larger story? That's the thing with Judas Iscariot. The discussions and mysteries around him are as lively now as they were thousands of years ago. 4. Was Jesus actually born December 25th? Ever wondered why we celebrate Jesus' birthday on December 25th? It's pretty baffling, because for the first 300 years or so of Christianity, nobody marked Jesus' birth at all. Instead, folks were all about Epiphany on January 6th, which was about the Magi showing up, and of course, Easter, which is all about Jesus' resurrection. Then, suddenly, in the year 336, December 25th, gets circled on the Roman calendar as Jesus' official birthday party. But was Jesus really born on that winter day? It seems unlikely. The Bible doesn't give us a clear date, and the whole scene with shepherds hanging out with their sheep suggests it was probably more like spring. So why December 25th? Well, it looks like the early church leaders wanted to line up Jesus' birth celebration with existing winter festivals for Saturn, the Roman god of agriculture, and Mithra, a Persian god associated with light. It was a clever move to make Christianity more appealing to the pagan folks in Rome. As years went by, Christmas started picking up steam around the Western world, though Epiphany and Easter were still the main events. Fast forward to colonial New England, and the Puritans were totally not into Christmas, thinking of it as too much of a pagan party with its gift exchanges and decorating trees. And after the American Revolution, Christmas wasn't popular because it reminded people of British traditions. But then, things took a turn in 1870, when the US decided to make Christmas 
a federal holiday. So from being practically ignored to becoming a major celebration, Christmas really changed its tune, evolving from a day with pagan roots to a key date for Christians and Americans alike. Three, were the wise men who visited Jesus really three? So about the Magi, you know, the wise men or kings we often hear about visiting baby Jesus? Here's something interesting. The Bible doesn't actually say there were three of them. That idea likely comes from the gifts they brought, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In the Gospel according to Matthew, it talks about their visit to see Jesus, but doesn't mention how many there were, just calling them wise men from the East. The word magi is from the Greek magos, suggesting they could have been priests, scholars, or astronomers, rather than the kingly figures we see in Christmas plays. The names Melchior, Caspar, and Balthazar, along with their royal tags, were added later, not found in the Gospel's original text. The Bible's story focuses on their mission to worship the newborn Jesus, not their royal status or detailed life stories. The three wise men label probably got picked up because of those three distinct gifts, and scholars like Leon Morris and D.A. Carson point out that we should look beyond traditions to get to the core biblical facts. And get this, their visit to Jesus might not have happened in the stable on the night of his birth, but rather when he was a bit older, maybe even a toddler. This flips the usual nativity scene on its head, suggesting our common image of them with the shepherds and animals at the stable is more an artistic take than a literal biblical account. To add to their mystery, the magi or wise men are mentioned in other parts of the Bible, like in Daniel, indicating a respect for their knowledge and role, although not always in a glorious light, as the story of Simon the Magician in Acts shows us. Two, were all of Apostle Paul's letters written by him? Let's delve into a real head-scratcher from history, touching on a topic that's lit up many discussions, the authorship of the letters in the New Testament, especially the ones like 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, known as the pastoral epistles. This isn't just some minor detail, it packs a punch. The big question is, if Paul didn't write these, then what does that mean for their divine endorsement? Think about the implications. If Paul isn't the real author, we're looking at the Bible in a new light. It's akin to discovering that a memoir you love was actually ghost-written. It changes the whole perspective. Traditionally, yes, there were lots of works back then written under assumed names, but outright claiming to be someone else in a personal letter? That was a big no-no, especially for the early church folks. Paul himself, in writings like 2 Thessalonians, was like, look, if you don't see my signature, it's not legit. So if Paul didn't craft these letters, we're left questioning the credibility and even the perfection of the Bible. It's like touching a theological third rail. Are we dealing with a holy book that includes some knockoff content? This shakes the core of what many believe about the Bible. But this goes beyond just figuring out who wrote these letters. It's about understanding how they slot into the broader spiritual and historical context of Christianity. If proof emerged that Paul wasn't the real author, it would stir up a storm about how these texts are regarded in terms of their divine or inspired nature. The key puzzle is how to mesh the revered status of scripture with the possibility of human flaws, or maybe even a purposeful mystery in who wrote them. This dilemma keeps the conversation lively and the debates heated. One, the physical appearance of Jesus. When you try to figure out what Jesus looked like, you hit a bit of a wall with the ancient texts. In early Christian art, there's a mix up. Some show Jesus as a young guy with long hair and others as a mature man with a beard. But when you leaf through the gospels in the New Testament, it's like they skipped over the details of his looks. The best clue we have might be from Isaiah 53, two in the Bible, which hints that Jesus wasn't someone who'd stand out for his looks. There was nothing about his appearance that would make him stick out in a crowd. Even without specific details, the Gospels do tell us he was as human as anyone can be. He bled, ate, drank, and had feelings. There's a lot of back and forth about his skin color. Was he black, olive, brown, or white? The scriptures don't really say, and considering Jesus was from the Middle East, being white might not fit the bill. But we're left guessing about things like how tall he was, his build, or what his face looked like. So with all the different images of Jesus we've seen over the years, we're still kind of in the dark about his real appearance. 
The stories from the Gospels make it clear he was definitely human, someone you could touch and talk to. But the fine details of his face and body, those are secrets that time has kept leaving us with pictures that probably say more about our own cultural views than the historical Jesus himself. So, we've just taken a peek into the fascinating world of the Book of Enoch, a text so full of secrets and shocking tales that it never made it into the Bible. It's really something, huh? I'm eager to hear what you think about all these mysterious bits we've uncovered. Why not drop your thoughts in the comments?